team is currently developing guidelines for quantitative biodiversity assessment of the livestock sector. His contribution to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was recognized in 2007 by a Nobel Peace Prize share between the IPPC and the former Vice President Al Gore. Team has published over 750 scientific papers, a scary number, and is the recipient of the Pfizer Young Scientist Award, the Canadian Animal Industries Award in Extension and Public, uh, the Alanco Award for the Production of Safe and Affordable Food, and the Sure Gain Award for Excellence in Meat Science and Nutrition. In his free time, I don't know where that comes from, <laughs> Tim enjoys biking and hiking with family in the Rocky Mountains. So today, Tim is going to present on the role of cattle in preserving carbon stocks and biodiversity. Please join me in welcoming Tim. Thanks a lot, Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's always great to have the opportunity to drive across the Prairie Provinces. So yeah. I. I drove from Leperich and I saw all the agriculture that's going on and uh, which makes Canada so strong in the agri-food sector. So it was a, a great opportunity and some places it's dry and some places it looks pretty good. There's a lot of variability driving across uh, the prairies this, this time in the year anyway. Um, so I was going to talk about the role of cattle in preserving carbon stocks and biodiversity. Most of this work has been supported by the Beef Cattle Research Council. We had a cluster, uh, Kim Aminsky and I worked together on, on the biodiversity. We still got some loose ends we're, tie, we're tying up in that area. Some manuscripts are going to be coming out, but uh, a really exciting area. And really, we, we sort of got into this because of all the negativity you hear about beef cattle production and, and the negative effects associated with greenhouse gas emissions. And we wanted to do some science in areas where we see benefits from cattle being on the land in terms of their contribution to biodiversity and the carbon stocks that are harbored within the vast grasslands of, of Canada as well. So Canada's growing climate change impacts. You know, when I put this slide together back when we when lithium was uh, burned and set the record for Canadian temperature, there was floods in the Fraser Valley as well. Uh, you start to wonder whether is that just a one-off, uh, but now we see what's going on again now, right? So they're they're in the process of uh, evacuating Yellowknife because of the fires. Uh, the smoke is, you know, and we used to get smoke every five or ten years in Alberta. It's a yearly event now in terms of air quality impacts and that. So it's becoming increasingly apparent that climate change is really a real phenomenon and it's here to stay and it's something we're going to have to learn to live with going forward. So the Canadian government's taking it pretty seriously in terms of the investment they're making and the focus that they're putting on climate change and methods of mitigation and adaptation. Uh, but if we look at what we're looking towards where they've made the commitment to try to achieve net zero by 2050, current emissions are around 730 million tonnes of carbon equivalents. If we look at how we can projectly reduce that by about 199 million tons uh, with projected cuts of current policies and, and actions that are in place. There's the opportunity for an additional reduction of about 348 million tons based on strategic opportunities that will be emerging in the future. So technologies that we know that exist and can be implemented. And then we have a shortfall of about 183 million tons, which we don't even have any idea how we're ever going to make that up at this point in time. So that's where we're really depending upon innovation. Uh, to try to achieve that, that higher level. And those reductions can occur across uh, the entire sector. Agriculture can make its contribution, but we'll never achieve net zero without a universal contribution from all sectors of society. So that's an important thing to remember. Agriculture certainly can't do it on its own. Most of the emissions in our sectors have actually increased since 1990, so for the most part, things are going in the wrong direction. An exception to that would be the electricity sector, where we've seen increased hydro, increased solar and, and wind, uh, which has reduced the reliance on fossil fuels for uh, electricity generation. Agriculture has actually gone up in emissions. A lot of that is due to land conversion, so the conversion of grasslands into croplands is responsible for the majority of that increase. And the other sectors for the most part have also seen increases in transportation and that as well. So part of the plan in terms of being able to achieve net zero, there's no way we'll achieve net zero without carbon capture and sequestration being part of the equation. Uh, there's a number of technologies and billions of dollars being invested now in terms of 
carbon storage, whether it be chemical or pumping it underground, lots of different approaches. Probably the one that's most economical is, is Iceland has got a process where they're using geothermal energy. Basically, they're capturing carbon dioxide and converting it into calcium carbonate or rock as a method of, of preservation and, and storage. Uh, the amount of carbon, though, that's captured through that process is less than a drop in a lake. Um, so at this point, it doesn't look like it's going to solve the problem. When I was involved in the, uh, interestingly enough, when I was involved in the bird flu outbreak, where we were using carbon dioxide as a method of depopulating the barns, there was a carbon shortage, carbon dioxide shortage. Yeah. Did I mute it? Nope. Yeah, so, so the okay. screen is muted. Okay. okay, so I'll carry on then. So. So at that time, there was actually a carbon dioxide shortage. So there wasn't enough carbon dioxide being captured in order to depopulate the birds across. Well, some uh, gaps that need to be filled in terms of carbon dioxide production relative to carbon dioxide capture. But out of all of those technologies, none is more efficient than the biological conversion of carbon dioxide into plant biomass through photosynthesis. And that's the only one at this point that was really when you look at the bottom line, is also an economical approach to carbon capture. So when we look at Canada's emissions overall globally in our contribution, we're relatively small, about 1.5%. United States and China lead the way in terms of total emissions. Uh, a lot of countries uh, try to use the reason, well, why should we bother doing anything if, uh, if the United States and China are not uh, doing their part in terms of the large amount of emissions that they have? But really, when we look at climate change, it's a global problem and it's going to take efforts from all countries in order to achieve the reductions that we need. When we look at agriculture, agriculture is comparatively small to many of the other sectors within Canada. About 10 percent of emissions come from agriculture. Transportation is, is much larger, uh, as well as the oil sands alone account for more emissions than what comes from agriculture. When we start to break down agriculture's emissions, then it's about a 50-50 split between methane and, and nitrous oxide. The majority of the methane comes from enteric methane production, so the uh, fermentation and the rumen and the production of methane in that manner. A uh, small amount comes from manure as well. Nitrous oxide, mainly for chemical fertilizers. So the more fertilizers, the more crop conversion we do, the more fertilizer we use, the higher the nitrous oxide emissions. There's a lot of technologies to try to reduce those nitrous oxide emissions, uh, various inhibitors and in that that are being explored, but uh, still probably precision use of nitrogen fertilizer is probably the number one tool that we have now to try to reduce the amount of nitrous oxide production that's being produced. And then carbon dioxide about 26%, so less than, than either nitrous oxide or methane. So when we think about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, though, we need to think about entire cycles. These, we're talking about a carbon cycle or a nitrogen cycle. And so we need to think of both about how, where emissions take place and where those emissions can be captured. And as I said, photosynthesis is a big part of that. Um, obviously, we've had uh, programs in place now planting a billion trees. But in order for that carbon to be captured in those trees, those car those trees need to be sustained. And so if you've probably heard of the, of the fires we've had, we're going to set a record this year in terms of fires in Canada. And that was more emissions, I think, than Indonesia's entire uh, year, yearly emissions that was uh, associated with those fires. So when it comes to the impact on climate change, it doesn't really matter where that carbon dioxide comes from. If it comes from the natural uh, forest fires and that, that still contributes equally to climate change as carbon dioxide that's emitted from the burning of fossil fuels. So we need to keep that in mind when we're looking at trying to really deal with the uh, overall impact of climate change itself. So the North American grasslands were a huge store of carbon, and one of which we've uh, converted a large portion of that uh, through release through cultivation. And sustaining those grasslands is going to be critical if we're going to meet any of our climate change targets. And when we look at greenhouse gases per hectare across the country, you can see from an agricultural perspective where those emissions are the lowest are in those grassland areas such as in Saskatchewan, southern Alberta, uh, 
uh, where there's less uh, intensive agriculture, more extensive agriculture. When we get into intensive agriculture, you can see the red areas there where there's very high emissions, the Fraser Valley in, in British Columbia, uh, Feedlot Alley in Alberta, where all our feedlots are, and Southern Ontario as well, where, where there's a lot of uh, intensive agriculture as well. So they have much higher emissions per hectare than our grassland ecosystems uh, produce overall. And the risk of grassland conversion, as I said, is, is continuing and we're, we're seeing that conversion take place even today. Uh, we've got some areas in southern Alberta where new feedlots are going in, uh, irrigation is being established and grassland is being converted over to cropland to produce feed for cattle. Uh, that uh, intensity differs depending upon soil quality and topography of the land, uh, but there's still areas that are, are going to be subject to conversion going forward. That has a number of negative effects, not only the release of carbon dioxide as a result of that conversion, but also it breaks up the land and uh, reduces the connectivity, uh, which are often corridors for wildlife to move through uh, and, and, and exist within those ecosystems. So that conversion is, is having an impact on the biodiversity within that landscape as well. And although we've heard a lot about going towards regenerative agriculture and intercropping and uh, you know, a lot of those technologies have been tried in the past. There's a reason why they go to monoculture. Uh, and unless there's some sort of incentives or some changes in the value of those intercrops, it's going to be difficult to see how that's going to be a, a savior in terms of increasing carbon sequestration in these lands or improving biodiversity through uh, a greater diversity of plant production. So this just shows the, the, the North American grasslands in, in Canada that they will harbor anywhere between 50 to 180 tons of, of carbon per hectare. Uh, that differs as you move further up north into the parkland region because you have more trees in that area, you'll have higher levels of carbon than what you have down in the, in the uh, native grasslands. But most of the carbon in grasslands is below ground and that is dependent as well on the species that are growing within those ecosystems. So if you look at Kentucky bluegrass, which is shown over there on the uh, on the far left, you can see that there's hardly any root mass below ground. A lot of the native species that grow naturally within the grasslands have very deep roots, and and a lot of that carbon is stored uh, either uh, well below the 100 centimeter level within those ecosystems. So the sustenance of that carbon is basically lost when we convert that. Uh, through through conversion and we start growing crops like barley or corn or wheat or other crops, canola, for example. So what is the, you know, the overall balance is really not that complicated when you look at it from this perspective. So really the soil organic carbon is a balance between the amount of decay that takes place and the amount of input. And the input is uh, also then uh, determined by the, the level of photosynthesis. And of course, then we've got harvest of where we remove some of that biomass and we use it for other purposes. So if the decay uh, exceeds the amount of input, then you're going to have a decline in soil organic carbon. Uh, conversely, if you have an increase in input and in photosynthesis and a re or a reduction in harvest, then you're going to have an increase in soil organic carbon. So we often look at, if you look at wheat or, or barley, we talk about, you know, we should be using that straw biomass uh, for other purposes. And there's been, you know, uh, approaches like cellulosic ethanol has been proposed for use of that material. We've got to remember that that is a form of harvest and we're removing carbon from the system if we do that. And as a result, there's going to be less carbon returning uh, to sustain soil organic carbon. <clears throat> so that carbon cycle is driven by microbiomes and you hear a lot about microbiomes today, the microbiomes within the digestive tract and how that affects human health. There's microbiomes associated with the plants as well that have implications for plant health as well. And of course, the microbiomes in ruminant animals as well, which are really responsible for the fermentation and the ability of cattle to derive energy from uh, plant cell wall substrates and, and during the fermentation process. So those microbiomes are, are not completely independent as well. The cow require, acquires mic microbes from the environment as well and deposits those in her when the fecal material that they, they leave on the land as well, and that then has implications for the soil microbiomes and the plant microbiomes as well. So that just sort of illustrates that here. 
where these are intertwined and, and a lot of work now is going on and really studying the the interspaces between improvements in digestive efficiency and, and animal health. So that soil microbiome in the carbon cycle has implications in terms of, as I mentioned, the soil organic matter decomposition, also within nutrient recycling. Uh, it can enhance nutrient uptake by the plants as well and water conservation. And of course, the carbon storage and sequestration are also influenced uh, by that soil microbiome. Uh, pest and pathogen controllers, data coming out now showing that uh, plants with a more healthy root microbiome are more resistant to pathogens. Uh, and also uh, there's interchange there that goes on uh, in terms of exchange of compounds as for the promote growth of the crops as well. And then you've got the greenhouse gas emission role as well, with both nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide and methane. Um, methane, of course, is more associated with anaerobic environments. So uh, wet, wetter soils will uh, more produce more methane than drier soils. And in the soil environment, it's also a combination of the methane emissions are a uh, balance between the methanogens, which produce the methane, and the methanotrophs, which can oxidize the methane, uh, which will then release to net methane release or no met methane release, depending upon the soil ecosystem. So when we look at the carbon, not all carbon's created equal, and, and by, for the most part, most of the carbon measurements have taken place in the above ground or uh, the um, residue that's left after harvest. Uh, and that's the uh, carbon that's the most mobile. And the lower ground to about 100 centimeters is where most of the studies have been done as well. And that's active carbon where there is a microbial biomass that would be carrying out degradation. So that carbon would have a relatively rapid turnover. The stable carbon is deeper below that level, and that's the protected stabilized organic matter, which will be the carbon that will stay in those soils for a prolonged period of time. So it's really the uh, carbon that's more recalcitrant to degradation by the microbial populations. Uh, humates or phenolic compounds will compose a large portion of that carbon. And, and that carbon will stay stable for an extended period of time. So that'll be the carbon, if we're looking at carbon storage, that will uh, exhibit the less variation over time if we can increase levels in that uh, deeper level. But because of, the, as I mentioned, as I showed in the grassland ecosystems, those roots penetrate down into that level in a lot of our annual crops, they don't. And as a result, uh, we don't tend to replenish those deep carbon stores as much as we do with uh, perennial grasslands. So cattle occupied a large portion of the grounds, pretty well the entire grassland ecosystem of North America was occupied by between 30 to 60 million bison uh, that were on, on, on the land. And of course those were it uh, in a relatively short period of time, less than 20 years, really, uh, the majority of the buffalo were removed from that environment. And that had a huge impact on the grassland system, the lack of manure production uh, in those systems in terms of the ability for arthropods to form in that manure, and that resulted in reduced uh, food supply for birds and reduced for sources for predators as well. So it, it really had a devastating impact on the grassland ecosystem. And that then was largely replaced. What we've done is largely replaced that by cattle. And grazing cattle uh, have many characteristics and behaviors in common with American bison. Uh, they're not absolutely identical, but identical enough that uh, to that point, cattle can support a similar ecosystem to what the keystone species did as, as American bison. The other thing to keep in mind is that biodiversity and the carbon cycles are intertwined. So greater biodiversity uh, results in a more efficient carbon cycle. Uh, so you end up with what these food, food webs, 
Uh, and when we look at grazing cattle and the role that they play, that manure still plays a really important role in terms of nutrient cycling and as an ecosystem for arthropods and other insects to establish as well. The uh, removal of those, you know, a keystone species from that environment, such as taking cattle out of a grazing ecosystem, will result in a reduction in biodiversity. And when we look at that same land is often shared by other, many other wild species, including ungulates like deer and, and antelope and elk, uh, share those same environments. And they often use a different food source than what the cattle are using. So there's not a direct competition between the two either. So there's a lot of hope that, uh, and you'll see some literature that says that the grassland system is going to solve climate change through carbon sequestration. And I think if you look deeper into the science, you'll find for the most cases that that's not going to happen. And the reason for that is because these grassland ecosystems tend to move towards a steady state. And so you have carbon input, you have carbon loss or decay. And it converges towards a steady state where the carbon levels and the duration for that to take place and reach that steady state will differ depending upon where you are in the grassland ecosystems and the environmental conditions that are present at, at, within that ecosystem as well. Levels of moisture, sunlight, et cetera, will, will influence how quickly that convergence takes place. But once that convergence takes place, then, and most people think it's around 25 years or so, then the level of carbon will stay relatively constant and will just variate slightly with perturbations such as fire or grazing or other activities uh, that may alter that carbon level. Cultivation is a severe form of perturbation and you know the duration of recovery for that may be much longer than 25 years if we were to allow uh, cropping system, crop systems to try to return back to the original grassland and with the various species that we bought in and that, it's hard to say whether it would ever uh, return to the original state. So cattle through, through the wallows, they don't produce as many wallows as, as bison do, but that creates a different environment where different species can survive as well. And, and also the dung beetles and that, they have implications for uh, altering soil health because they they uh, change and 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 uh, stir up the soil. They move uh, manure down deeper into the soil profile. Uh, so that all has implications for uh, the level of carbon that's in the soil as well as the types of species that will survive within those uh, various environments, those microenvironments that are created. So the conversion of to cropland represented a huge loss of soil organic carbon. And that's because of that disturbance uh, creating a situation where the microbial populations are uh, basically activated as a result of exposure to oxygen and, and the mixing of nutrients, which then allow them to utilize carbon, the carbon sources as a substrate producing the carbon dioxide, which results in the reduction in soil organic carbon. So crops differ depending upon the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that they produce. Forages are the lowest, but if we produce something like corn silage, then that can still have high emissions, even though it's a forage. Uh, generally speaking, the greater the degree of cultivation, the more soil that's exposed, the greater the emissions there will be from, from uh, that crop. Now, we need to balance that as well. Uh, these are emissions. It's not necessarily carbon capture. So you've got some advantages with corn as well in terms of its photosynthetic capacity and the amount of yield that will take place and the carbon that's captured in that manner. Uh, but in terms of soil organic carbon, it can still result in a reduction of, of, of carbon in the soil as well compared to perennial forages. So this is just showing some changes in, in carbon uh, release from a, over an 18 year period. Uh, at a long-term plant at Bow at Bo Island. And you can see the amount of carbon that's emitted from either fallow, so summer following basically, resulting in much larger increases of carbon than what did contribute to cropping with wheat or a, a combination of uh, fallow, oil seeds or wheat, or wheat alone. But if you look at the grass, the amount of carbon we captured was, was substantially higher as compared to those cultivated crops. <clears throat> 
So when we put grass into the system, we're investing more carbon in that system. And as a result, we can increase soil carbon levels. Now, I know Alan Awas has started a trial like this at Swift Current. I think it's been probably going on for about seven years now. And there, it hasn't been a straight where they took cultivated land, converted it directly to, planted it down to perennial forage. That increase in carbon is not linear. So if there's, they went through a couple of drought years, so they did get a lot of photosynthesis happening, and they actually measured a loss of carbon subsequent to the planting of, of the perennial forage. So as I said, that carbon sequestration or carbon regaining you know, of carbon in those systems when they're converted back to perennial grasslands is going to be heavily influenced by the environment. And if we're moving towards more of a drought system, uh, more frequent droughts, of kind of what we've been seeing on the prairies, then that recapturing that carbon, the uh, returning those back to higher levels of carbon is going to be more difficult than what it would have been previously. So this sort of just shows that through regenerative uh, agriculture, where you're you're looking at long-term pastures. So when we cultivated the material, the, the land, we lost a lot of carbon at that point. Continuous wheat cropping, uh, eventually that will reach a, a plateau as well, but at a lower level than what uh, was present with the perennial grassland. But if we reestablish perennial forage, or we do a wheat forage rotation, or we add manure, we can restore some of that carbon back to the system. And that's where manure has a big advantage because it directly adds organic matter back to the soil, which is not the case with chemical fertilizers. So lots of cases and the level of uh, ability to recapture or move sequester carbon depends upon how much you'd lost in the first place. So if you're undertaking fellow crop type of systems, uh, where you've lost a lot of carbon, then if you switch to a well-managed grass system, you're going to have the maximum amount of carbon captured. Whereas if you maintain that system or go to a continuous cropping, you might be able to increase that uh, carbon level through practices such as zero tillage. Uh, but that level of increase is not going to be near as high as what it would be if you created the, that back to perennial forage. Uh, and then how long that is sustained and how high that can uh go on for whether you know at this point it doesn't look like it would ever achieve the same levels of carbon that were in the original grassland ecosystem the other caution about this is is i talked about the environmental variations in terms of carbon sequestration uh, but we really don't have a good feeling as to how long do we need to monitor these systems to ensure they've reached that steady state it, it'd be nice the longest i think long-term plots is around 200 years in the uk It'd be nice to have plots that were 500 years old so that we could make those measurements over an extended period of time and ensure the carbon that we captured was indeed stable and, and was going to maintain in that ecosystems. And measuring that is not simple either. It takes a lot of replication and, as I said, replication over time. So not only do we see these ecosystems contributing to enhanced biodiversity and, and uh, carbon uh, storage within within grassland ecosystems. They also have a really important role in wetlands and carbon sequestration and the, the pothole prairies uh, and their uh, contribution to biodiversity and carbon sequestration as well is really important and really not an area that's been, you know, I think uh, I've already said about how the grasslands are really not giving credit for the carbon sequestration that they got in the natural grasslands and within the grasslands, probably the wetlands have not got the credit that they should have for the amount of carbon that they sequester because it's even even higher than what's in the uh, upland grasslands. Plus that also contributes to the biodiversity because you have a whole aquatic system now uh, which expands the biodiversity as well. So the difference is, is when we look at cultivated lands during that land conversion process, one of the common practices is also the drain these wet areas and convert them for cultivation as well. And if they have higher levels of carbon than the surrounding uplands, you're going to have even a greater release of carbon as a result of that drainage and cultivation process. So this just shows a, a catchment basis where the amount of uh, megagrams of carbon varied from 43 on the upland areas. So the upward slopes down to 66 um, megagrams per hectare in the wetlands. And the wetlands accumulate more because, and often they'll create the anaerobic system. So they're relying on uh, 
uh, anaerobic systems as part of the carbon cycle. So that results in stable conditions uh, where that carbon will sequester. So if, if we look at those wetland systems and where probably the largest carbon is stored in Canada is in our uh, peat system, our peat systems and our, our, uh, our muskeg and that in, in the northern area where those anaerobic conditions as carbon uh, is deposited in those ecosystems, that carbon remains relatively stable because of the uh, low efficiency of, of, of methanogenesis in terms of recycling carbon compared to aerobic systems, as well as those are often acidified as well, which results in increased stability. So that wetland system will have even higher levels of carbon than what's in the upland systems. As you increase the amount of oxygen, then you uh, increase the release of carbon as well, just like I mentioned, as a result of aeration and cultivation of the soil, same uh, principles. And of course, then that results in a whole new wet uh, food web that's related to aquatic organisms that, that live in those wetlands. Those also contribute to water quality because of the filtration effects they can have. A lot of those also feed uh, underground streams and that, so well water and that is often uh, filtered through those, those grassland systems before it enters into underground streams and that as well. So cattle can also have effects on carbon sequestration and biodiversity. So at an optimal stop, stopping, stocking density, so you have disturbance in that and, and trampling in, of nutrients, which uh, alters the ecosystem as well, contributes to diverse plant communities, both above ground and below ground through those root systems. It's cattle, when they consume, if they consume seeds, they'll spread those seeds as well across the landscape at the same time, all helping to increase soil organic matter cover, which will increase that water holding capacity, fertility, and the ability to, to, to produce food from these lands. This was uh, just a study that was done in Alberta where we had um, out at a place called Staveley. So it's uh, in the Porcupine Hills of, um, of Alberta where they had different levels of grazing uh, over uh, a very long period of time, over 60 years. And they had light continuous and heavy continuous grazing. And you can see that with the light continuous grazing, they end up with uh, more emissions uh, because of of the cattle uh, with the forage eating lower quality forage than they would be with the heavy grazing conditions because in the heavy conditions that uh, forage land or the, the plants within that uh, grazing area were maintained in the vegetative state versus reaching the mature state with light continuous grazing. Uh, but when you look at the amount of soil that was sequestered, soil carbon sequestration, uh, it was higher with the light grazing continuous relative to the heavy continuous grazing. So more root development, more below ground carbon was stored as a result of, of light continuous grazing. So grazing can have an impact, uh, particularly if you have heavy continuous grazing over multiple years, which was the case in this study. And that's going to have impacts on, on, on biodiversity as well. In most cases, uh, Biodiversity studies have, have focused on a single taxon, so basically studying the impact of grazing on birds. Very few studies have taken a multi tax approach, looking at a variety of different uh, organisms and wildlife that exist, exist within those ecosystems, and then trying to make a, a balanced judgment of the impact of that grazing or that cattle occupying the land on the grazing system. So when we look at the loss of, of the tall grass prairie, the short grass prairie and Alberta grasslands, how much we have lost overall. Um, but most people don't realize that the tall grass prairie, for example, is a more threatened ecosystem than the Brazilian rainforest is. So we hear more about the Brazilian rainforest than we hear about these prairie systems. There's about 60 of Canada's species at risk that exist in these grassland ecosystems. Um, many of them we, we hear about, some have uh, had uh, reintroduction programs like the swift fox and, and the burrowing owl, but they're still endangered and uh, there's still work to be done if, if those species are going to continue to persist within those environments. So grazing intensity, uh, heavy grazing, as I mentioned, can have a negative effect on biodiversity. Part of that, though, is we're looking at heavy continuous grazing. So year after year after year, it's less clear what impact would if you had heavy grazing and then allowed the uh, area to sit dormant uh, 
or uh, not be grazed in the following year. That would be more mimicking of what the bison would have experienced where they would heavily graze in areas those herds moved through, but they may not return to that area for two or three years later. Uh, so it's probably that that sort of uh, management would not have the same impact on biodiverse, negative impact on biodiversity as heavy grazing continuously year after year does. But light grazing has a positive impact on both species richness and species biodiversity as well, particularly in relation to plant species uh, and, and promoting their diversity. So one of the comp, you know, one of the things with when we tried to comp, uh, basically start to quantify the contribution of biodiversity to sustainability, it was one of the last metrics that were actually calculated. And the reason for that is it was much more difficult to come up with a way of uh, basic through life cycle analysis to uh, characterize the impact of biodiversity on sustainability as compared to greenhouse gas emissions, where we had a whole bunch of equations and we could generate numbers that would easily be calculatable. When it comes to biodiversity, it's, it's much more of a preference uh, or a judgmental type of thing in terms of which species people prefer over another. And you can have human uh, interventions, such as what we've seen with the con land conversion we've seen to crop land and to uh, in producing more grain, lead to an increase in some species, such as the pigeon. So if you go into the feedlot areas of southern Alberta, you'll see a lot of pigeons in those areas because of uh, they're feeding right out of the bunks that are being used to feed the cattle. Whereas you go to other areas like in the grassland ecosystems, you know, the sharp-tailed grouse, which previously would have occupied those areas that are now occupied by feedlots, we've had a dramatic negative impact on that species. So we have these increaser and decreaser species, which will either increase or decrease below the reference level. And uh, that's in, in bird species, there's a lot of variability in that with some species being uh, virtually eliminated, whereas other species have increased, you know, since per European times, more than 10 times their original population. So can we increase carbon in the landscape? We need, we need varied landscapes. A lot of the margins in that that we have now, when you look at uh, where is the greatest biodiversity and where is the greatest carbon, it's in these uh, areas that are along the margins that are not easily farmable. Uh, the riparian areas and that, those can help contribute to that biodiversity and carbon, but they still suffer from that lack of connectivity because there's uh, seldom is there uh, corridors that connect these, these regions together. And no matter what uh, food production system we look at, there's always going to be trade-offs. So we need to understand those from an ecosystem perspective. We need to consider them from the carbon and nitrogen cycles as well and, and how our practices can alter those. So if you look at something like reducing the nitrogen fertilizer rate will re result in less nitrous oxide emissions, but if that fertilizer is not properly applied to meet crop yields, we'll have a crop requirements, we'll have a reduction in yield. Likewise, if we have fewer cattle grazing land, we'll have less methane, but we might have a reduction in biodiversity or plant biodiversity within grassland ecosystems. Less forage, we'll have less methane from cattle that consume uh, forage versus those that consume grain, but that has negative implications for soil health. And if we suppress decay, so we have less carbon dioxide emissions, but what does that do for the health of microbial populations and soils? So it's really about taking a, a, a whole systems approach and uh, considering all of these systems. And I think that's why, you know, we, we hear about People advocated we need to eliminate livestock from agriculture production, basically, and without really an understanding of the negative connotations that would have uh, and why we really need to be thinking about how we're going to integrate livestock cropping systems together, which has you know, become a challenge because we have a pattern where we are getting increasingly large crop producers and increasingly large livestock producers, and they don't necessarily talk to each other or interact in a manner that would result in the greatest benefits from an ecosystem perspective. So well, that's it. Just want to recognize the funders. And we did talk about a lot of this stuff on a podcast they had called Cows on the Planet, which I think is still available. Project's done, but I think the podcasts are still available. So thanks a lot. Excellent. Thank you, team. Uh, so I'm going to open up the floor for 
questions in the room and then I'm going to hand over to Charlene to read through the questions from the uh, online. Uh, I'm going to start with one thing. So, so there was an amazing book and paper for Martin Glaser about human gut microbiome and extinction of bacteria as a result of modern lifestyle Western diet. Do we have the same concept when we compare the grassland with the soil from the croplands? Do you see any extinction or depletion of certain you know, microbes? And is there any opportunity for the livestock like, to restore? Yeah, there's there's definitely definitely changes, and those changes are immediate upon cultivation of the land. So the the most uh, obvious are, are changes in soil mites and lichens and mosses that were would be associated with the natural grassland system. As soon as you cultivate, you destroy those. And then, you know, it's just a matter of studying because of when I talked about the food web, how everything's ultimately interconnected. If you study back what the loss of those were in terms of what it means for soil fauna, then you can document those changes and they'll flow right through to the microbes as well, the bacteria at the same time. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, maybe. <coughs> One, from a practical point of view, how could we or can we convert, uh, convince crop producers to switch to grassland and uh, beef? Well, I think we're seeing, you know, there's some positive movement in that direction in terms of a greater use of crop rotation. So we're, we're seeing less of monoculture the same year after year after year. So that's... That's not turning into the grassland, but at least it's a movement in a positive direction. Um, I think we also got to recognize that we also need to produce food. So I didn't want to beat up on the on the crop lands either, right? Like the feedlot production is an important part of our beef production system. It's why our system is one amongst the most efficient in the world. If we didn't have the feedlot component, we wouldn't be as efficient as we are. It uses a lot of byproduct feeds as well that come out of other processes like canola meal or distiller's grains and and that kind of thing, or or wheat that doesn't make the grade for human consumption. So we need that integrated system for, for sure. Um, but I, I think that moving towards, uh, you know, just recognizing these and making the changes such as the rotation, there's a lot that are now growing forage as part of that rotational process. They'll put uh, alfalfa or grow some other forage in, as part of that. We, you know, we can't, I think it's unrealistic to think that we just you know, we would never produce the same amount of food if we decided we're going to plant the prairies back to grasslands, right? Mm -hmm. So that's not realistic either. So what we need to do is look at those, take that holistic systems approach and, and make changes where we think they will have a positive impact, realizing that we're never going to go back to the local system. We have a question from Alan Krita. You want to go um, ahead and unmute him? Yeah. Um, hi, Tim. Thank you hi. for the presentation. Um, I had a question like, so um, it, it's it's not related to really um, preservation of carbon stocks at a landscape level, which will like require more holistic approach to it. It's more related to the market side of things, as in um, at a whole farm model level, maybe. Uh, so we have these... Um, little startups coming up or enterprises coming up which are claiming to price carbon at the farm level these days and in doing so it's like talking about carbon like a crop like growing crop and and you put a price on it you have carbon credits that the farmers can um, make use of in the market now how how credible is that approach that's like my question even at a farm i understand even at a whole farm model level if it might need an uh, a holistic approach i mean it's the integration of different aspects of farming but how credible is that approach the way these enterprises are claiming to create a market for those for for carbon well, there's a lot of there's a lot of talk about that, and there's been some movement in that area for sure. I'd say that I, you know, I'm, I'm not a producer, but talking to the producers, um, the, the the approaches that have been used previously have not been adopted by the producers to a great extent. Probably the largest one would be related to the use of zero tillage as a method of conserving crop carbon in in cropland areas. That one has probably had the greatest uptake. 
Uh, but it also makes a difference whether you were practicing it before 1990 or not. If you were, then you don't get credit for it. So there's there's some complications like that that even though you're doing good things, you don't get credit for it if you did them too soon, which doesn't make a lot of sense when you're trying to deal with the problem. The other ones I would say the amount of uh, paperwork and auditing and verification that needs to be done in order to capture those credits. The work that is required for that has been offset by the value that they get back from taking undertaking the practice. There's also a lot of middle people like uh, aggregators and things like that. They take their cut of the money too. And so at the end of the day, I think in many cases, the farmers have just decided there's not enough in this for me to bother doing it. So that's that's been a, a barrier. Many of the technologies, though, that could lower emissions are presently not economically feasible under the current production system. So if there was a price on carbon and producers were given a benefit for utilizing those technologies that would offset the costs of using those technologies, then we could have an increase in, in adoption rate. But offsets, you know, as I said earlier on, you know, a methane molecule, whether it comes from agriculture or, or from oil and gas or from a, a peat bog, it's going to have the same impact in terms of contributing to climate change and its global warming potential. So if we were doing an offset so that we're rewarding somebody in one area by reducing their emissions so that we can have somebody else keep their same emissions in another area, that's not going to solve climate change problems we'll still see an increase in the amount of uh, greenhouse gases and atmospheric concentrations as a result. The next question from the people in the room. Hey, uh, uh, Brian Merrill used to present uh, on greenhouse gases a few years ago and talked about this breath in, breath out each year. And if you put that breath in when you grow a, a, a canola, or sorry, a, a corn crop, there's a whole bunch of carbon captured that one year. Does it matter? You know what's grown on the ground in terms of how much we're capturing through the summer. Uh, like a, that, that, I'm, I'm wondering if the accounting is capturing the current. Account. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. So I, I sort of mentioned that when I talked about yeah. corn has the advantage of its high yield, right? Yeah. So it captures a lot more like that. Another area that we see on the prairies where we could make a big difference is related to the siling of of cereal crops. So in southern Alberta, in that area they're taking that silage off second week of July or so, even in some cases the first week of July. So it's a long period of time where the stubble just sits there and there's no carbon sequestration going on because there's no photosynthesis, there's no crops planted. So that's an area where we could have cover crops that would capture carbon during that period of time from second week of July through to the third or fourth week of September uh, before we have our first frost that we're not taking advantage of now. But at the same time, you know, we always have to think about they, they use the same approach, uh, similar idea in, in Brazil with their civil culture, right, where they've got uh, trees growing in conjunction with cropping or with grazing practices. But once you produce a carbon store like that, it has to have some value. So what, what are you going to do with it now? Like, and if we're talking a cover crop, what is that being fed to? What is it going to displace within the feeding regime, right? Like if we're already feeding the animals. If we're producing more feed, what animals are we feeding that to? Or what, what feed are we not no longer producing? Because now we have this new feed that we can produce uh, and provide to the livestock as well. Yeah, well, that, that's the other question. And, and that needs to be considered where, where you're looking over multiple, multiple years as well. Yeah. And then that carbon has to be stable as well, right? If we burn it, then we just release it immediately anyway. I have a question from John. Hi, Tim. Um, Hi. I, we are producers out here at Ericsson, Manitoba, and um, I'm wondering if beef that is finished on forage has a better carbon picture than beef that is finished in the traditional way where calves go to feedlot alley at an age of about six months. Yeah, it all depends on how you look at it. So if you consider the, that those animals are consuming forage and the carbon that that forage is sequestered, and if that's from grasslands and you've got that deep carbon in the roots that I talked about, uh, then you can make that system. If you, if you get credit for that, 
then you can look at beef cattle production as a net sink of carbon in that system. But if you just look at the feeding side of things on an intensity basis, uh, because cattle don't grow as fast on a forage-based diet as they do on a grain-based diet, then the amount of emissions per kilogram of beef produced will be higher. So that it's really from your perspective. And then, of course, when I, I also mentioned about with the grass, you've got all the additional biodiversity benefits associated with grassland production of beef, which you really don't have with feedlot cattle production. Feedlot cattle production is really not any different than standard crop production, because the majority of what's fed in the feedlot is crops that are growing on cultivated land. Well, I guess I'm looking at finishing cattle on perhaps not native grassland or uh, on legumes, which uh, alfalfa, which are deep rooted. Uh, so if, yeah. you can, if you can get the deep rooted crops in, it seems that you're better off from a carbon perspective. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And alfalfa is the most productive of the forages that we have in terms of average daily gain that we can obtain in an animal. If, if you graze animals on alfalfa at a vegetative state, you can get gains that are not unlike that you can get in a feedlot as long as they don't bloat. Yeah, you're exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, thanks, Tim, for the excellent presentation. I was really interested in that graph where you showed uh, light and heavy grazing. So there was a benefit, light grazing in one case, you know, as far as uh, having carbon storage benefit the soil, but it wasn't as beneficial when it comes to emissions. Or uh, I guess the graph had kind of a counter. Um, yeah. Message there. Could you expand on that? So on balance, what what is it that we should pay attention to when it comes to just carbon? Forget the biodiversity. For yeah. So so when you when you feed forages of, of a lower quality, you end up with more production of a volatile fat as acetate is produced more in the rumen, less propionate. Propionate is a hydrogen sink, and so you'll end up with more methane from a lower quality forage. So under light continuous grazing, those crop, those plants within that grassland are allowed to reach full maturity. And as a result, the quality of forage goes down as we get into the fall, and that results in higher methane emissions. Yeah. If you maintain it in the vegetative state, then the amount of emissions are lower because you have higher propionate production. So the balance, if I have to add those two figures up, obviously it helps with your carbon storage in soil, but it hurts you on the emissions. That's right. So in the end, when we did the calculations on that, it was a positive. A positive. Yeah. Okay. The amount of soil carbon was higher than... The, the, the amount of methane, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have more questions online? Okay. Oh, oh, one question. <laughs> um, thanks, Dr. McAllister. I got into an argument with my brother, who's an organic farmer in West Central Saskatchewan. I suggested that once the market figure out how to sell products of regenerative agriculture, the organic products would fall out of favor. And I thought their practice of summer follow was particularly problematic. And he said that when the bison were prolific, that they churned the soil so much it was black and it looked like summer fallow. And I just want to hear how wrong he was. <laughs> and was there ever a time where bison would have been heavy grazing? Like, would it have been, ever looked like that? Well, never, it would never achieve the level of summer fallow, for sure. But, you know, when the bison moved as the herds and <clears throat> what we would, to find that, you know, what, what we did, the difference is that we built fences, right? So cattle can no longer freely move across the landscape like the bison could. So where the bison had been, if we go and looked at that, we would say that that's overgrazed. But that's the herd moves on, right? They don't stay in the area that's overgrazed. But they, they go to where they can get easier forage. Um, and then the thing is, is that how frequently did they return to that? They probably didn't come back to that same area for two or three years. So it had an opportunity to recover. That's the difference. If we fence the animals in and we overgraze it, and then we put them back in the same pen, they're still going to overgraze it more, right? And that's where you start to get damage. So it is possible to improperly graze uh, natural grassland landscapes for the detriment of that environment if you overgraze it. Not as bad as summer. No, you'd never achieve the same levels as summer. Fall. You know, summer fall had it, the you know, wind erosion and that. I'm, I'm convinced that. Some of the droughts that we've had since then, since the 1930s, if we had 
practice, the same agriculture practices that they did then, they would have been just as bad in terms of the wind and erosion that we would have seen. But the zero tillage and all, you know, that had a big positive impact on preventing or reducing wind erosion, increased snow, uh, snow retention as well. So there's a lot of positive things with zero tillage, but there's some negative things as well. We had to increase our herbicide usage, uh, increase levels of fungus and plant diseases because of the aftermath that left as well. So that's why I'm saying there's always trade-offs, right? And, we, you know, organic agriculture is good. It's not going to produce more. Uh, if, if people want to buy it, they can buy it. And if they'll pay more for it, that's fine too. But, you know, that's... So we're, we're also, in, you know, not against people getting in local, you know, 100 mile agriculture, small scale. That's all great. Like we need to produce food in whatever way we can. But there's not too many people who want to spend their afternoon hoeing potatoes anymore, right? So... One last question from Kim. <laughs> Yeah. So we talked about this, in this concept of you know a perennial landscape only. Then obviously there has to have some market for those for those perennials, right? In order for the producers to be sustainable. And even if we develop a carbon market that could capture that, we still need that forage to go somewhere. Um, in and, and, and it can go somewhere, but whether the 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 outcome or the financial remuneration for that is equal to an annual crop obviously is a huge question we now see a lot of commodity groups and companies that are moving towards a net zero goal how do you see the future in terms of engagement between um, either commodity groups or in terms of um, companies that offer some financial remuneration to producers other than the carbon itself so let's say for biodiversity and other things so that that perennialization of the landscape or not 100 percent of it but some movement towards a more perennial landscape is actually economically viable for producers where it doesn't have to occur at the at their hand in terms of producing the product is actually coming from some compensation because as a as a society we recognize the value of these perennial lands can you can you share your thoughts about that yeah, I think that's kind of a tough one because there are, you know, there, there are multinationals and that that realize that their practices are not completely sustainable from a biodiversity or from a grassland preservation perspective. So they will, through donations or whatever, attach themselves to a practice that's promoting that, right? But that won't be their mainstream business. That's more like we're doing public good stuff as well. That's a, a big part of it. So I, I don't see it going beyond that and from a corporate perspective. If you look at what's happening like the in the European Union, it's like if you go to a country like Norway, who, who's who been paying producers to farm in a certain way for a long, long time, right? So in Norway, the government pays the sheep farmers to take their sheep up into the mountains during the summertime, even though they know they're not going to make any money doing that. Uh, but because people, the tourists, like to see sheep on a hill when they go out to, to visit those areas. And the government pays for that and makes it economical for the producers to move from there. So that kind of process could, could incentivize that, right, in a way to, to make that happen. But I don't see, like, corporations are not going to put money into things like that at the expense of their own corporate health, right, in terms of what they're trying to mainstream products. And that would be what I would say. Thanks very much. Two. Two questions. So we are a little bit over time, but let's go ahead here. Yeah. Okay. I have a question from Gord. Gord, if you want to unmute, you can ask your question. I'm okay now? Yep, you're good. Okay. So I'm calling from Manitoba. Um, we custom graze some beef cattle, try and do it regeneratively. So <clears throat> I get into arguments all the time with relatives and friends about eating beef. They get the message, beef bad, don't eat beef. And my argument has been, and one of the arguments beside the biodiversity argument, is um, beef cattle don't create carbon in the system. They just recycle it. So what's the big stink about CH4? They're just recycling it. The problem is you driving your car back and forth to work. So can you comment on that? Have I got any, yeah. have I got a good argument here or not? 
No, you're you make a good point because we if you think about it, like so we we penalize cattle because they ferment uh, forages or carbohydrates and they produce methane. But if you take the manure and you put it in a biodigester and then we produce methane there, then we see that as being a good thing. You know, you can get credits for doing that. So it doesn't really add up. The difference is, is that if you look at the methane that we get from fossil fuels, that carbon was stored in the ground and it was stable until we drilled a hole in and opened it up so that it could get into the atmosphere. The methane that uh, cattle produce was carbon dioxide or carbon in the form of the plant before it became methane during fermentation. So we didn't add an additional carbon to the atmosphere in that process, all we did was cycle it. So we call that biogenic methane. So it is different in, in that it's not adding, if we, you know, if we just had cattle and we never released the carbon from fossil fuels, we wouldn't be talking about climate change at all. Uh, but now that we have, then once that methane molecule though gets into the atmosphere, that methane molecule from the cow has the same impact on global warming as the methane molecule does from fossil fuels once it's in the atmosphere. So that's that's the difference. So you're right in terms of we wouldn't be talking about climate change if we didn't ever use fossil fuels as an energy source. But then we'd all be pretty cold in the near time too. <laughs> I'm trying to take the pressure off the cattle farmer here and promote cattle people to eat beef and saying, really, they're not the problem. The problem is us. And so am I right or am I? Yeah, no, you're you're right. You're right. It's not the cows that do the oil wells. Right. Oh. It's the people. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. So I have one more question from Jacques. Um, I have a comment, not so much a question. Uh, I raise a bison, and um, I've never had one that's bloated when it was on pasture with alfalfa in it. They uh, they know when to, to stop eating the alfalfa as long as they have uh, grasses to eat. Am I correct? Well, I've always heard that, you know, anecdotal. I've heard that many people tell me that. But I really would love to get some bison and test that in an experimental situation and, and then figure out, like, if they don't bloat, why do they not bloat? Because there's got to be something different about their microbial population then. But we've never we've never tested that. Have you grazed it? Like, it makes a big difference what stage the alfalfa is in as well. But if you, you know, if you take cattle and you turn them out on alfalfa at the vegetative stage, and particularly if you don't feed them the day before, you'll get a, a lot of bloat. But I've never tried that with bison. I've done that with cattle, but I've never done it with bison. Well, I'd offer you to come in and uh, <laughs> do it with mine. <laughs> but I'm, do I have I'm to trying sign to any sell kind of right waiver now. if there's losses. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. In, in, the, in the interest of time, let's finish it here. Let's give another. Thank you, everyone, for joining. It was a really interesting discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot.